The center Malcolm Boole gingerly fingered a page from the classified geological report one of his adepts had just handed him. We found it. Our prayers have finally been answered. Bless Blake. After the fatigue of devoting countless hours poring over the ancient Starleed's records and Benton's private files, after the stress of hiding and then spending millions of sea bills searching treacherous terrain, Boole had finally found it. A place for his blessed order to call home. Despite the hot, stuffy interior of the modified Magellan Series 4 research vehicle, all of Boole's doubts faded away in an instant. His hope, once waning, was renewed. Again, the gift of faith had provided. Again, Blake's blessings of strength had seen his children through. Boole closed his eyes and silently recited the words of Blake in reverent prayer. We are the children of Blake. We are the blessed who will bring humanity out of the darkness and into the light. We fervently pray for the candle of knowledge to light our dark souls. He opened his eyes and smiled at the report. Here, on Epsilon Eridani, he would use one of the ancient Star League's long-lost deposits to secure a new future for Comstar. A future where Comstar would be strong, respected, and even feared. Here, Bull would reform the Comguards. Here, he would reforge something precious. Something Comstar and Blake's children had lost. He would build a new future for humanity. Our goals are peaceful. We seek unity and prosperity of mankind. This action was taken to save lives in the devastating war that is unfolding. Comstar will continue to offer its communication services to all member states. As long as the soul system and our neutrality are honored. For centuries the Inner Sphere was guided, knowingly or not, by the invisible hand of the successor entity to the Star League sitting at the heart of its now defunct empire. Comstar, a religious, military, clandestine, communications company and political entity in many ways kept the Inner Sphere either at war or at peace. Throughout the entirety of the Succession Wars, built to be a religious order by Jerome Blake and Conrad Toyama, this organization would manage the HPG network the means of faster-than-light communication across the Inner Sphere. Its own history would be rife with internal divisions as the centuries carried on. Disputes over religious, political, and economic interests would split the order more than once, with those who were on the losing side of history often losing their heads in these violent, but short, misunderstandings. How the order did business within would impact the inner sphere as a whole, changing the flows of communication. There would also routinely be deliberate sabotage efforts, killing people who were involved in projects that the Order disagreed with on the outside of their own limited realm. The Great Houses would from time to time challenge Comstar, almost always finding themselves on the losing side, as Comstar emboldened their enemies and hindered the communications and resources of the aggressive houses. This arrangement would continue seemingly without end, until the 31st century. First, the formation of the Federated Commonwealth and its success in the Fourth Succession War blew in the face of Comstar's attempt at keeping a balance of power between the houses, and preventing such immense gains. Technologies were also rediscovered with the Hell Memory Corps, 
breaking part of the monopoly Comstar once had on technology as a whole barring FTL communications and advanced space drives. This would be briefly appearing to reverse with the capture of the Free Worlds League's government through Thomas Merrick and his body double Thomas Hallis being part of Comstar's order, as well as with the victory of the Draconis Combine over the Federated Commonwealth in the War of 3039, a conflict which Comstar heavily invested in to help the Combine achieve victory. Where things would begin to go awry for Comstar would be with the arrival of the other major successor to the Star League, the Clans. I admit a certain fascination with Nicholas Kerensky. Not as a historical figure, but as a man. What was it like for him to deny his heritage under the shadow of Amaris's cutthroats? How did he deal with people looking to his father as a god? What force drove him to develop the whole of clan culture? Anastias Focht during the clan invasion, Comstar would begin to change. It would also be one of the catalysts, accidentally, for the invasion itself due to the Explorer Corps stumbling upon the clans and being captured. But more importantly, Comstar in fact collaborated to some extent with the clans themselves, not realizing the true danger they were in. Comstar had, after the War of 3039, been accelerating their plans to reconsolidate control over much of the Inner Sphere. In their agreement with the clans after their first communications, they would agree to administer the worlds conquered by the clans themselves. To the Inner Sphere powers, they simply claimed neutrality, but in reality, this was the beginning of a power play by the organization, who sought to use the clans to their own end, believing them perhaps to be either a tool or a kindred spirit in the image of the old Star League. It was only when Frederick Steiner, otherwise known as Precentor Anastius Fogt, discovered from Ulrich Kerensky the true plans of the clans, which was to conquer Terra itself, did Comstar change sides, and almost immediately set forth taking the clans to battle, using their own trials and honor culture against them. To us, Fighting for rank is alien and almost barbaric. To the clans, it ensures that their most proficient warriors rise through the ranks. This is only one of the reasons I recognize these enemies for the threat that they are. Anastias Focht. What followed was the legendary Battle of Tukiid, one of the greatest military conflicts in the history of the Inner Sphere and a battle that determined the fate of humanity and the 31st century. To unravel the entirety of Tukiid would be an enormous script in and of itself, and so will not take place in this particular entry. However, it is impossible to understand the fate of Comstar without understanding some of what took place. The Comguards, guided, built, and administered by Precentor Marshal Anastius Focht, the former Duke of Duran, would make a challenge to the clans, a trial of possession for Terra itself, using the world of Tukiid as a battlefield for this contract. If Comstar won, the clan invasion would be halted for 15 years. If the clans won, then Comstar would relinquish control of their home and the most holy site, Terra, to the clans themselves. It was the battle of the two successors to the Star League. The children of Kerensky would fight the children of Blake. The clans, a barbaric alien culture which had evolved from the maddened personality cult of Nicholas Kerensky, would fight the religious order of Comstar and many of its most ardent zealots. The successors to those who had been left behind and abandoned by the SLDF. The clans would bring an enormous force of galaxies to the battlefield of Tukiid, while Comstar would bring the entirety of their Comguards, barring those who were protecting the homeworld of mankind. Through manipulation of clan honor and pride, the use of favorable terrain, massed use of artillery, 
and through a willingness to sacrifice their lives for their homes, and for humanity itself, the Comguards would see a victory over their clan counterparts. Many of those saw this as a divine victory, blessed by Blake's holy light. Some of the greatest wounds would be suffered by Clan Smoke Jaguar, one of the strongest clans prior to the invasion. Already they'd been maimed with the recent defeat on Luthien, but the defeat on Tukiad was yet another crippling blow. They would be one of the major clan forces to achieve none of their goals set out in the trial. And their defeat was amongst the most shameful, and truly a setup for the Jaguar's final fall. Clan Ghost Bear would achieve just over half of their goals, but would eventually win a small victory in the campaign, but not enough to sway the outcome of the events in favor of the clans. They would be amongst the most prosperous clans after the battle, even if they still bore some of the shame of defeat in their own way. Others simply carried such a larger burden that they could hold their heads high regardless. Clan Jade Falcon did savage damage to the Comguards, but were never able to totally overwhelm them. With time during this battle, they would be ground down, and their capabilities slowly bled away. They would achieve half of their goals, but they would not acquire the status of a minor victory. Instead, the Falcons obtained a draw in the broad scheme of things, which was far from the glory they sought. The other clans all attempted to contribute, and some, such as Diamond Shark, Steel Viper, and Nova Cat, suffered immensely for it, seeing major changes to their own internal politics. Worse, the three clans all failed to achieve any of their objectives. The defeat for the Sharks saw the wholesale change of their leadership and culture, for instance. The failure of Steel Viper was another major note and would inevitably lead to the worst event in clan history, the Wars of Reaving. And Comstar, by contrast, knew victory, but in this victory would be the escalation of an internal dispute which would see Comstar split and slowly erode away, only to die with a whimper less than a century later. The truth is that Saint Toyama understood the vision expressed in the words of Blessed Blake. It is slanderous to taint such a visionary with the stain of madness or blind obsession. This is heresy in the highest order. Those who would say this will suffer in this life and the next. Comstar would fracture, ironically, with the victory on Tukiat. Primus Mindu Waterly would attempt to take control of the Inner Sphere through a maddened plot named Operation Scorpion, and, in the attempt, would be killed by her subordinate, Anastius Focht. Mori Shirilar would be made Primus after this was completed, and the two would go on to attempt to reform Comstar into a more secular organization. This would create a rift almost immediately, and many within the organization could never abandon what they knew to be the divine truth of Jerome Blake's words. It wasn't possible to reform such people, and they were rife within the organization. In fact, they were also rife among the veterans of Tukia. The fracture would become real with one percenter Demona Aziz taking up the reins of leadership of the disaffected Blakists within Comstar and leading them into the protection of the Free Worlds League. Thomas Merrick, the real Thomas Merrick, and likely Thomas Hallis as well, were also members of the group and would agree to allow their stay within the League. She would die, and eventually Thomas the master, Merrick, would find his way to power. The secular Comstar, in the meantime, would go about their reforms. They would have some who would never abandon their faith, but simply didn't agree with the extremism of the word of Blake. But this also meant that there were persistently and consistently problems with moles within the organization, working for the word of Blake directly. Eventually, the word of Blake would take Terra from their Comstar counterparts. 
driving the secularists from the birthplace of mankind. They would go on, with time, to establish a protectorate around Terra, and believed it was their destiny to come to power through the restored Star League. From there, it was believed that they could unite the Inner Sphere under Jerome Blake's eventual vision. As they believed, it was foretold by Jerome Blake and Comrade Toyoma's holy texts. Prior to this happening, the new Star League collapsed. The results were, in a word, disastrous. The word of Blake had been infiltrating the Free World's League's government, economy, and military, and would utilize these resources in what was to come. There were also an enormous number of hidden assets from Comstar's long history that they would tap into. And with that, the word of Blake would launch a holy war on the Inner Sphere to enforce the Star League upon the now unwilling members. Catastrophic destruction would come from this. The powers of the Inner Sphere would be put on the back foot before a figure would emerge. A man named Devlin Stone would lead the beleaguered and battered forces of the Inner Sphere to their final, conclusive victory over the word of Blake, and their master. Comstar, the more secular Comstar, would be a part of the coalition that saw the end of its breakaway sect. With the death of Thomas Merrick and the fall of the word of Blake and its allies, the world would change, and Comstar would be forced to change as well. All that saved mankind during its last so-called Dark Age were the churches and religions. These were havens in humanity's learning, and they stood alone as beacons in the darkness and foulness that humankind had become, to preserve history and knowledge. If Comstar is to survive into the future, it must look towards these religions as a blueprint for surviving the wars that are unfolding around us. The Ending of the Passage of Survival Jerome Blake In the aftermath of the annihilation of the Word of Blake, and the liberation of Terra by the coalition of the states at war with the Word of Blake, from the periphery, inner sphere, and clans, Devlin Stone would be given a chance to build something new. The Republic of the Sphere. This would not be easy by any means, and it would not be clean, as much of the space of the old Terran Alliance would be incorporated into this new state. Populations would be relocated, some through incentives and others through force, in an attempt to remove their affiliation with their prior successor states, when deemed necessary. Arms controls and leverage against mercenaries were put into place, and a peace, outside of the birth of the Republic and its wars with several of its neighbors to establish itself, would last for several decades. Devlin Stone appeared to be a strong man, a hero to the people who suffered so much for so long, in the core of the Inner Sphere. But this was only one aspect of who the man was, and what his organization did. He was perhaps a hero to some, but he was most certainly a villain to many, and not simply to the now defunct word of Blake, or the states of the Capellan Confederation, Draconis Combine, and former Free Worlds League. Because after the destruction of the word of Blake, Devlin Stone and his new state would also go about undermining one of their allies in the war against the word of Blake. The secular Comstar was now deemed to be too much of a threat, in many senses and reforms were ordered to take place by the now emerging Republic. The most notable, immediate order was the complete disarmament of the Comguards, and all other military forces within Comstar. These had been loyal soldiers defending the Inner Sphere, and with the stroke of a pen, they were more or less officially turned over to being the last shameful remnants of the enemies they had just fought. Rom, Comstar's intelligence, had been one of the greatest intelligence services in the history of the Inner Sphere. They were able to sculpt the development of the Inner Sphere with this asset, and despite many ROM agents siding with the word of Blake, 
there were more than a share that remained loyal to Comstar, even in its secular form. These two would be immediately disbanded, and either absorbed into Republic intelligence, were forced underground, or were shamefully dismissed, many having to look over their shoulders for the rest of their lives within the Republic itself, if that is where they chose to stay. These two demands were met immediately by Comstar with concession and surrender, but the shame did not end there. Comstar employees would be relegated to being watched at all times by the Republic of the Sphere's military and intelligence from the moment the disarmament started. Even in its secular form, Comstar had placed Jerome Blake in high standing, as one of the last heroes of the Terran State and Star League and as a man with guiding wisdom, which could be learned from, claiming much of what he had said had simply been perverted by Toyama. Even then, within Comstar, even battling the word of Blake, there were still many who were truly faithful, believing in Blake's divinely inspired words, and simply believing the word of Blake to be aberrant heretics and fanatics. This too now not only would face scrutiny, but near annihilation. Comstar was not in theory legislated into discarding its religious trappings, or its veneration of Jerome Blake. But the truth is always more complicated than that, especially when taking into account that they were watched at all times. The leadership made the difficult decision to simply adapt to the changing world as they saw it. Even traditional phrases used by Comstar for centuries, like utterances of Blake's blood, were heavily discouraged. The last of Blake's religion and veneration would seemingly be extinguished with this capitulation. Even with these changes, going from religious warrior order over to seemingly casual businessmen, however, was simply not enough, and in the early years and frequently afterwards, Comstar employees would be treated with mistrust and even disdain from the general public, who saw them as a holdover from the word of Blake. With time, these employees would be treated with a modicum more respect. Purpose gave way to corporatism in many of the rank and file, and much of the spirit that had been Comstar just washed away. To many, this was the death of Comstar. It died with a whimper, after marshalling its resources one last time to protect the inner sphere, even if it was from their own brethren. Strangely enough, in the years that followed during these purges and persecutions, the people most understanding of Comstar's plight were their traditional enemies from Tukiad, the clans. While their spheroid counterparts viewed them with disdain and distrust, seeing them as being only one step away from being the word of Blake themselves, even years after the end of the Blakist assault on the Inner Sphere, the clans understood the difference, because they had their own schism between Wardens and Crusaders. It is therefore a great irony that those who understood them the most were those they were most famous for defeating. But within this organization, within this shell of what had once been the Masters of Terra, and the successors to the remnants of the Star League within the Inner Sphere, there was a flicker of light still remaining. While that flicker was there, it had no cause, no leader, to allow it to prosper once more. But the faithful were not wholly gone. Remnants of Rom would still exist, of the religious variety, in some cases as deeply embedded agents within governments or within noble families. Within the technicians, administrators, and researchers at Comstar compounds and HPG stations, there would be small numbers of the faithful, sometimes mere individuals, other times small groups or families, but nonetheless, the light had not fully yet gone out. It was still an ember, a last flicker. We fight to preserve Blake's true intent. We offer asylum to all who believe in the vision for the future of humanity. If not for the efforts of Blessed Blake, 
mankind would have been left to the darkness. Join us in the light of his wisdom, and cast away the ignorance the Republic has constricted you in. But there was more fire left in these embers than one might see at a glance. During the Dark Age, or the Era of the Republic, even prior to the events of what would become known as Grey Monday, assets of the Religious Order had started to once more coalesce within Comstar. They were not the word of Blake, nor even its true successors, but those who would come to be known as the Blessed Order. There was a multitude of reasons for this organization to have appeared. The disdain which many Comstar staff were kept in at various times across the Inner Sphere likely played a role in creating an insular culture in different areas. Aging, but still faithful members of Comstar likely would pass on their teachings to their children, who would grow up and graduate into Comstar as their ancestors had often for centuries before, though keeping their religious beliefs to themselves, and a quiet spreading of the ideology to the talented, but disaffected within the organization would also take place. This would slowly but surely become a movement within Comstar itself, even if it wasn't seen by the plain sighted. This was the beginning of the Blessed Order. The Order would slowly attempt to gather support, beginning to take shape in the early 3100s, with the hopes, dreams, and faith that they could restore Comstar to what it had been before the Schism and before the tragedy that reforms and secularism had brought to it. Comstar, one time, had been more than a soulless corporation, managed by armed thugs, keeping those who kept communications and knowledge alive under lock and key. They would, however, find a leader, eventually, in a talented man of faith, who would take control of the organization likely after his highest level of promotion within Comstar itself. Malcolm Boole was born supposedly in 3076 in the Federated Suns to a pair of Comstar technicians named Gerard and Elaine Boole. This would have taken place before the violent conclusion of the Blakist era, and there is speculation that his parents were not in fact Comstar technicians, but members of the Word of Blake, who would later smuggle him or themselves back into the organization in some form when he was in his infancy though this is unsubstantiated. In fact, his own record of birth is unsubstantiated as well, meaning both scenarios are possible. For the purposes of this entry, it is written and assumed that Malcolm Bull's parents were in fact members of Comstar, and not members of the Word of Blake, removing the insidious intent from his very existence in the Order to judge his actions more fairly. Malcolm, perhaps much like Jerome Blake before him, was a gifted child in many respects. Or at least we can infer this partially from the fact that he was enrolled into Comstar's advanced HPG program on Terra after graduating from a dedicated Comstar secondary school on Markinson. We can also conclude that this is true because it's specifically noted that educators were impressed from the start with his innate grasp of interstellar communications. Malcolm after completing his education on Terra, would go on to serve on several worlds in their HPG stations, and would progress up the ranks during this time. In fact, he would become the head of a communications branch for five years before the Primus, the head of Comstar, selected him to head up the Special Projects Administration. This latter event is a major contributor to the growth of the Order. The resources of the Special Projects Administration could and would be utilized by Boole to enhance his own position, place people he trusted in roles within the branch of the organization, and would allow him to invest funds and personnel into projects which other entities, either the Republic or the Great Houses, may not see. In fact, within the organization, several important changes would occur. Quietly, and without the knowledge of the full organization, some semblance of Rom would emerge once more from within the Blessed Order, which would be used to insert spies across the Inner Sphere, often replacing or coercing nobles to their side in various great houses. This part of the organization may have had those who were inserted as agents prior into various parts of the Inner Sphere find their way home as well. 
though this would be speculation on the part of this video. More importantly, 20 years prior to the HPG blackout, supported by the fledgling Blessed Order, and later by Bool's department, the Comguards would covertly be reformed, at least in the broadest sense. Veterans associations of disgruntled, faithful ex comguard soldiers, survivors of the Blakist era, would gradually become training organizations for a militia of soldiers, largely recruited from their own children and grandchildren. It is from this stock of trained infantry, mech warrior pilots, and other crews that the Order would begin to reform their new comm guard from. First, they would be tested in battle under the guise of private military contractors, gaining experience and resources covertly through this mechanism. Resources would be directly siphoned from Comstar covertly, and by the 3120s, into building a quiet military and industrial base to arm and equip this proto-resurrected Comguard force. Including with the development and construction of new successor mech designs to emulate the horrifying celestial battle mechs of earlier times. A permanent base would be created named Alpha Base on the world of Epsilon Eridani, which was consecrated as a holy site in the eyes of the Order. The first division of the Comguards were reconstructed by this time, and would be given the name of Unending Faith, as a gesture to the faithful within the Blessed Order, who had persisted decades within the organization despite being suppressed and persecuted. All of this had been done successfully beneath the Republic's nose, with the large, powerful nation-state and its guardians being utterly unaware of the Order's success in building a small industrial base, multiple shell corporations, and a military and political headquarters on a world within their own borders. Prior to the blackout, Alpha Base would face probing attacks by mercenaries on behalf of local entities in the mining field, as well as by pirates, and these would be violent affairs, but the Com Guards would win decisively, annihilating their opposition. This gave them more experience and allowed for more training of new, faithful recruits. All seemed to be going well. The first level 3 division since the religious wars of the 31st century was fully formed, as well as expanding, and was largely combat ready. With more time, more divisions would form so long as everything remained on course. The stars became silent. As of the making of this video, it is still not known who is responsible for taking down the HPG grid. There are speculations and accusations, such as that a covert Word of Blake cell did it, but nothing has been truly confirmed. On August 7th, 3132, 80% of all Hyperpulse generators ceased functioning, and almost none of them would be able to be brought back online. Faster than light communications had become an absolute necessity and linchpin for commerce, politics, research, and cooperation in the inner sphere. With its catastrophic failure, the results were nearly instant across human space. Worse for Comstar itself in its corporate form, the collapse of the network meant that it would almost immediately begin to bleed financially, as its primary income came from running the network. Every sea bill was, at its heart, time on the network. With the HPGs now silent, without their song, the ability for corporate Comstar to operate as it had was vanishing. Debts instantly began to be racked up only ever backed with the idea that once more Comstar would become a viable company through running interstellar communications. This would never come to pass. Internally, Comstar became a fractured mess as it attempted to understand what happened, and had no resolution in sight. In the meantime, the inner sphere would begin to devolve almost immediately. Wars would begin to break out first inside the Republic of the Sphere as long-suppressed peoples began seeking reunion with their former home territories, even with peoples who were allied to the Republic of the Sphere, such as the Swordsworn wishing to return to Davian, or the Stormhammers wishing to return to Steiner. 
the chaos would inevitably spread into other portions of the Inner Sphere. The economy became dependent on messenger jump ships, much as it had been in the early days of the Star League and before. Wars would then explode in multiple directions, as even the clans were impacted by the blackout. The Leering Commonwealth would invade the former Free Worlds League with the help of the clans. The Capellan Confederation would openly back one of the breakaway regions of the Republic and invade, with the Draconis Combine following suit. War would break out with the Combine and the Federated Sun shortly after, and even the Periphery was unable to escape the carnage and chaos that followed. The longer things stayed as they did, the worse they would become. The Blessed Order believed only they could rescue the Inner Sphere from this madness, and Bull himself created a special projects organization to resolve the issue, and to do so as quickly as possible, and brought the best and sharpest minds from across Comstar to work towards resolving the problem. A young Comstar technician, not inducted into the Blessed Order, Tucker Harwell on the planet of Wyatt would discover the means of restoring the HPG network seemingly. This, unfortunately and unbeknownst to the Blessed Order, would be the beginning of the end of Comstar and their sect. Seemingly everyone immediately went into action to secure Tucker once the HPG station came online. Clan Spirit Cat, the Republic of the Sphere, and the Duchy of the Orient, one of the breakaway regions of the Free Worlds League, all made moves on Wyatt to capture Harwell, but he would be rescued from the situation by the Blessed Order, as the Comguards entered the situation and retrieved their miracle. Sadly, however, this would bring the eyes of the Republic onto the Order. Worse still, Harwell's solution had only been a temporary fix for the network, unfortunately. And once in Comguard captivity, he would do his best to resist his servitude quietly, hoping for rescue from the Republic of the Sphere. This would go poorly, as attempts to solve the HPG network solution failed one after another, and he was blamed for those failures, eventually being tortured by his own sister, who had joined the Order herself, to learn from him what they'd missed or of his treachery. He would survive this, and would later be recovered by an infiltrator from the Republic of the Sphere, a knight named Alexei Holt. Alexei would report the location of the Blessed Order, which would begin the process of its final act. We are a broken people, in body and spirit. Broken. Just like our mission, our holy responsibility. Malcolm Boole, prior to his death, on February 20th, 3141. Forces of the Republic immediately began to hunt the new Comguard. After the loss of Harwell and the chaos of his escape, a decision was made by Boole to retreat all Comstar's First Division and its leadership to Epsilon Eridani, to Alpha Base, the new headquarters from Comstar while in their exile from power on Terra. It was a complex he himself oversaw much of the reconstruction and design of almost 15 years prior. Before this even began to happen though, Forces of the Republic of the Sphere immediately assaulted their position, a region named Omega Base, as it had of course been given away by Knight Holt. The Comguard, the Unending Faith, would take a stand against the Republic forces with several holding actions as the Order withdrew all of its main and vital materials and personnel from this location, with the Comguards who had been fighting this holding action evacuating afterwards. Over the course of the next four months, the Blessed Order went to ground, attempting to evade the Republic at all costs. Due to failing to properly scrub Omega Base prior to its falling into the hands of the Republic, their forces would discover the location of Alpha Base on Epsilon Eridani. Once this fact was discovered, the Republic would spend any volume of resources to destroy the Order even as its own political and military fortunes were coming undone as the Capellan Confederation, Draconis Combine, clans, 
and internal rebellions were tearing the state apart piece by piece. The Order, not knowing they'd been made, were once again beginning research into attempting to solve the blackout. But now, at their primary facilities. What progression was made, if any, would die with them. The Republic would dispatch, first, a warship named Auspicium, which was a heavy cruiser. It would arrive first into the system to investigate. The Order and their comguards were horrified at the arrival of a powerful vessel, and would attempt to buy time by striking at it with fighter craft. But before long, their primary jump ships were utterly destroyed by the warship, turning the planet below into their tomb. No escape would be possible any longer. Republic ground forces in the form of the 14th Hastati Sentinels touched down on World on February 11th, 3141. These forces, despite their elite status, arrogantly geared up from landing sites and moved without taking many factors into account. First of all, this was Comstar's territory, and they knew the ground well. Second of all, the new Comguards were a veteran formation. Third, they did not take into account deliberately made kill zones or other forms of ambushes and traps. A vicious series of blows would land on the Hestati Sentinels before the first day was even concluded, and the haggard and bruised force was sent back to their landing site by the Order's army. Several more attacks were launched against the Sentinels in the days that followed as the Comguards savaged their supply lines, shelling their position and cutting deep into the unit. The only problem was the Hastati were only the first unit to arrive, not the entirety of the Republican force. Stone's revenants landed on February 15th, reinforcing their Hastati counterparts before driving into the Comguard's lines. Fighting emerged in the hills and forests surrounding the landing site as it was turned into a true battlefield. Every inch of territory was fought over and men and women within the Comguards traded their lives to save the sacred soil of their home, and of the base which was a holy site, and the last bastion of the Faithful's Order. The majority of First Division would be forced back by the now superior forces of the Republic, taking refuge in the mountains and making the aggressors pay a heavy price for their entry into their realm. War would come in the mountains, however, even as the bridges were blown by the defenders to stall the attackers, desperately looking for more time. The Republic fed more men and materials into their efforts to destroy the Blakists where they dwelt, and despite taking further losses, their engineers blew away enough of the mountains to get a clearing for their next attack. Intense artillery fire was launched by the defenders on February 19th, trying to blunt the assault by the Hastati Sentinels which had regrouped from their prior problems, and were now on the verge of breaking through the Comguard lines. This would be halted by the arrival of several Comguard dropships, which had remained hidden, and which had deployed a series of vicious Omnimechs to the field. In addition to this, cruise missiles were launched from these dropships, wreaking havoc on the Republican forces and ending their advance before the Comguards completely crumbled, giving them time to regroup. The artillery was what was keeping the Comguards in the fight, both conventional and now within their dropships. The Republic had had enough of fighting in the mountains, and enough of being bled for a battle against what they perceived was the most notorious of enemies. To them, this was a continuation of the fight against the word of Blake. No quarter would be given, and they would risk all to achieve victory. A dedicated combat drop was taken at the start of the 20th of February, despite mechs taking withering fire from anti-aircraft positions. They would land in enough numbers behind the Comguard position to send the guards into disarray. A hammer and an anvil was forged, and the Revenants and the Hastati made their move. The battlefield would descend into a bloody skirmish at close range, for both infantry and battle mechs which lasted well into the night. The skies were black, and the ground was turned red with the blood of both sides. For the defenders fighting to the last bullet wasn't an option, they had to fight to the last man. 
Even in surrender, no quarter would be given, as the Republic was never meant to provide any mercy. And this was demonstrated well enough with the battle ending with no prisoners taken. By late February 20th, forces of the Republic broke into the mountain complex of Alpha Base. What followed was a complete massacre. Worse still, the troops who cleared through the base employed flamethrowers, even against those who were no longer able to defend themselves. Every person within the building, every person in the Order on World, would be scourged from it. There are no records of civilians or the families of the defenders surviving this encounter either. Ool listened to the gut-wrenching screams of the injured and the dying as the black-painted Xyphos battle armor turned to its left and sprayed part of the room with its arm-mounted flamer. As it slowly panned back towards Bool's prone form, sparks and ripples of electrical cords sprinkled and danced off of the armored suit's head and shoulders, while the eerie glow cast by the shooting flames outlined the faintest hint of charred bone. It was death incarnate. Bool chuckled and coughed up blood as the Xyphos completed its turn. He had a moment to muse at how carelessly the battle armor incinerated human flesh. The charred end of the suit's flamethrower then sprang to life. The Blessed Order would die on Epsilon Eridani. The last remaining defenders would make a final stand in the mountains from the 21st through to the 25th, where the Republic would pursue them, despite losses of their own, until the complete destruction of the last remnants of the armed forces of the Comguards. These people fought only with despair in their hearts as they battled against their killers and the people who not only killed their friends and fellow believers, but also their loved ones. The combat would come to a final close, with the last survivors detonating an avalanche, which killed some of their pursuers. No elements of the Comguard survived on the surface of their new homeworld, but the pain was not yet over for Comstar. The Republic, in its darkest hour, as the Capelling Confederation and Combine picked at its flesh, as the clans prepared for ever more brazen assaults, had its worst fears confirmed that Blakus in some form had yet survived through the scouring of the Inner Sphere. What followed was a witch hunt within Comstar. Every person was investigated, and even more scrutinized. Though it's not said directly, it can be assumed arrests were made both rightly and otherwise, as the entirety of the organization was nationalized while being militarily swept through. Every asset of the company was turned over officially to the Republic, and Comstar was forcibly integrated into the government of the Republic of the Sphere. After this, no independence was granted to its staff. A thorough purge of what was left of the organization also took place after 3144. The light was put out. In an ironic twist, fate's wheel would turn once more, and only seven years later it would be the Republic's turn to be utterly annihilated and cast into the wind. Perhaps fittingly so. This was an incredibly difficult script for me to make, I'm not going to lie. First of all, with Elements of Treason Opportunity, a book I reviewed on the channel earlier this year, I had hopes that this wasn't the real end of Comstar's story. Funnily enough, I only read it after several Comstar fans messaged me about it, expressing excitement that they'd been pulled from the abyss. I would later be told by several developers, and politely, I should add, that Comstar was in fact dead, and no one should have their hopes up for such a revival. It's not planned, and it's not coming. Elements of Treason is not the start of something new, it's a one-off villain, and won't be reflective of the lore. There is no faction coming, there is no meaningful hidden element of the Order, or some other Blakist branch. It really is the end. 
Perhaps at some point after 3250, you might see the return of the word of Blake, but I would have my doubts. This information came to me before I started working on the script, and it really made it more difficult. As I've said before in other videos, I like being excited for things. And the idea of having all the Blakus factions be dead and gone in the setting, which were the legitimate third major faction pool of the setting, is very much depressing to me. Comstar, the Blessed Order, the Word of Blake. They brought something unique and beautiful to the setting, despite sometimes being misused or pushed into certain storylines which didn't work. They were the real ying to the clan's yang, much more than the Inner Sphere is and were their own element of the setting. In short, the word of Blake was all but dead, and Comstar was degraded, but the Blessed Order lived. It gave Comstar and even word of Blake players somewhere to go. But the Blessed Order is now dead as well, and so is Comstar. So, there is really nothing for the people in the new era who really just loved the faction. Worse still, I think that the setting feels lesser for them not having a part in it. Something unique has been lost. The technology indulging cybernetically augmented religious fanatics really did have their place in all of this. It feels even more bizarre when you take into account the Clan Smoke Jaguar, a faction I enjoyed, was brought back in a forced, bizarre, unsatisfying way, but Comstar will remain dead regardless. I would simply say that the death of Comstar does not feel particularly cash money to me, as it were. It doesn't really work in the context of a war game either, especially one where you have factions. If Comstar, the Blessed Order, and Word of Blake were all destroyed, that's not entirely a problem provided there's some form of successor faction afterwards. Comstar is more than a communications company after all, but now it just isn't. It might be among the biggest tragedies to have happened in the franchise, in my estimation. Not within the confines of the universe, but for the players and for the setting as a whole. I should also make it clear that Comstar is not my favorite faction, but that doesn't stop it from being something that gnaws at me every time it comes up. But there isn't much I can do about that. But I thought it appropriate to share my thoughts after telling you about their definitive death, and with my prior video telling you about their origins. I don't expect to meaningfully see them again. Don't fall to false hope, such as people who were excited for the elements of trees and arc. This is the end of the line. So with those final words, I would like to thank you for joining me here today. I hope you all enjoyed this particular video, and if you did, It'd be exceptionally helpful if you hit the subscribe button and the like button, as it does help the channel when you do so. When you subscribe, you'll be notified when my content goes live, and I think you'll enjoy it. If you enjoyed the video I put together, even more, however, have you considered becoming a member? When you hit the member button, you also help ensure that I can put the appropriate amount of time into long format videos like this one. In fact, this video was asked for specifically by channel members, and it was voted for, meaning that this video was made upon member request and verification. Which means that this channel and this video are only made possible because of viewers like our members. And with that, I hope you'll leave a comment below on this video and the contents about it. I look forward to seeing you all there, even if the subject matter of this video was a bit more of a downer. And with that, I hope everyone has a great day and enjoys their holidays.